generated good questions and good discussions even after the event took place. The Ayala LinkedIn discussion group has never been so active as now, and I hope we will continue connecting at this platform to discuss technical matters in the future. So if you have an aids to navigation or VTS challenge out there, drop a line in the Ayala LinkedIn discussion group and someone around the world may be able to help you out. I will now first give the floor to the Deputy Secretary General of Ayala, Mr. Omar Fritz Eriksson, for an update on important Ayala matters. Omar, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, Geraldine. <clears throat> and uh, a good uh, morning, afternoon, evening, everybody. Uh, it's, uh, it's great to see so many people here and uh, from uh, uh, a quite a cross section of the world, actually, from Africa to the Pacific. And uh, this looks like um, Japan as well. So very good indeed. Um, I have uh, one announcement from Ayala, uh, which is about developments in our so-called IGO project. Uh, which uh, has just passed a very important milestone. For uh, more than a decade now, IL has been working on uh, changing our status uh, from being a non-governmental organization to an intergovernmental organization. And last year, um, a diplomatic conference hosted by our national member in Malaysia reached uh, an agreement between 50 coastal states on the text of the con uh, Convention on the International Organization for Marine Aids to Navigation, a new international convention. In January this year, the government of France signed the convention as its depository, and the convention is now open for signatures by all United Nations governments for the next 11 months. The French government is in the process of contacting the coastal states of the world through uh, diplomatic channels, inviting them to become parties to this new international convention. Those countries who sign the convention within the time frame of the 11 months I mentioned, will in a way become the founding fathers of the new Ayala, and I would like to encourage all those present to help us to spread the word. Now is the op opportunity to become founding fathers of the new Ay Ayala. Having said that, um, our experience from previous webinars is that people are uh, quite happy about them and, and, uh, and uh, there are a lot of questions, um, particularly after, after the event. Um, and I, I sincerely hope that uh, you will find this webinar uh, interesting and uh, informative and, and, and valuable. So over to you again, Geraldine. Thank you. Thank you, Omar. Uh, this series of technical webinars is developed to address some specific challenges related to aids to navigation worldwide. And each of these webinars include a lecture on uh, such a topic, a case uh, will be presented and you will have the opportunity to discuss or ask questions. The subject of today is aids to navigation maintenance, as during my technical missions I have seen that this can still be improved a lot. Poor maintenance can turn an aid to navigation in a danger to navigation, and this can lead to major maritime disasters. Before we start, I would like to inform that there will be a question and answer session at the end of all the presentations, so please feel free to write your question in the chat box or raise your hand. And after the official webinar closes, the line will stay open to chat. And I must say that we truly enjoyed to be able to catch up with you by this means. This webinar will be recorded and posted on the Ayala YouTube channel. And for now, to save bandwidth, please switch off camera and mute your microphone. 
The two first speakers of today work at the Pacific Community, uh, well known as SPC, and this is the principal uh, scientific and technical organization in the Pacific region. Ms. Francesca Pradelli, a maritime lawyer, now leading the Pacific Safety of Navigation project, together with Mr. Salesh Kumar, who is a hydrographer Cat B and aids the navigation officer at SPC. And he is an Academy alumni. Francesca Salesh, the floor is yours for a lecture on aids to navigation maintenance. Thank you. Thank you, Geraldine. Just let me share my presentation. Can you one second? Let me just put in the presentation mode. Yes, oh, I can confirm okay. we see the presentation, Salesh. All right, thank you. OK, thanks everyone for joining this webinar. So a good morning from uh, SPC here in Fiji and good evening and good morning to all of us uh, around the world. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank uh, Ayala for giving us this opportunity to be part of this uh, fourth webinar on eight on maintenance. And I'd like to welcome uh, our colleagues from the Pacific here. And I also like to say hi to Stephen Bennett, who has been my lecturer in the 2018 uh, course in Calcutta. So welcome, uh, everybody welcome aboard. So just to start with this uh, webinar on eight on maintenance, as Geraldine said, is uh, eight on maintenance is uh, vital for any country. So the main message that I like to convey for this webinar is that maintenance is required to ensure that aids to navigation equipment and systems continue to perform at the levels required by the mariners to safely navigate the world waterways. So a maintenance system should be adopted to ensure that aid on assets deliver the desired performance while minimizing the total ownership cost. So moving on, so the outline of our presentation today will be something in this format here. So we're just going to look at the maintenance strategy, the principles of maintenance, commissioning item equipment or systems, some of the maintenance goals, total cost of ownership, item service intervals, and at the end we have some uh, a guidelines that was developed by SPC here. And uh, my part uh, colleague here, Francesca, she will discuss on uh, those guidelines. On this uh, webinar, most of my examples will be from the Pacific as we do a lot of work around the Pacific here. So, and all the pictures that you see on this presentation are from uh, our work in the Pacific here. So, so uh, I'd like to bring attention to the, the main important guidelines that uh, uh, we are supposed to follow regarding item maintenance. So guideline 1007 on lighthouse maintenance, 1047 on cost comparison methodology of buoy technologies, 1076 on building conditioning of lighthouses, and the very important one is 1077 on maintenance of Aton, because this guideline has an access which gives good examples of uh, specific Aton's that uh, need maintenance. And the other guideline is 101140 on commissioning of Aton equipment, and maintenance. So first of all, maintenance strategy. Uh, what is a maintenance strategy? So if you just uh, think about strategy, strategy is just a plan or an action to achieve a long term or overall aim. So what we aim to achieve here is that for the competent authorities to have a maintenance strategy in place so that they have a plan or something they can follow on to achieve their overall goal. So in regards to the maintenance, each and every type of aton, whether it be a short range aton for short range, what we mean, which is can be within a visual, audible, or radar range of a mariner, or whether it be a long term uh, aton, such as a radio aton or VTS, VTS equipment, we will require specific maintenance strategies 
uh, for all these specific types of atones. And what uh, different uh, uh, maintenance procedures require according to their different uh, categories. So the category can be either be uh, someone's microphone is on. No, it's okay. Okay. So the categories can be either cat A, category B, or category uh, uh, sorry, category one, category two, or category three. For example, category one atone, which has availability of 99.8%, we know that it can only fail for two days in a three-year period of about a thousand days. So we have to have a specific sort of maintenance strategy to look at the category one atone so that we can repair those atones if they fail within the two days uh, time limit so that it falls within that ILR availability guidelines. The other important thing is the site access. Uh, very important as well, as we can see how, how you will go to that uh, atone for repairs. For example, whether you go by boat, you go by helicopter, or by a ship, you take a horse ride, or you walk to the iTunes. So it's very important to be part of uh, that uh, strategy as well. The other thing is the power supplies. Uh, mostly here in the Pacific, most of the iTunes that are uh, on at the sea are mostly either solar powered or they have their battery powered. But there is some on shore which are also uh, powered through the mains. So it's also a thing to consider for the maintenance strategy. The other one is climatic conditions. As we know that uh, in the Pacific, we have dif uh, different seasons, actually only two seasons, which is the wet and the uh, dry season or the cyclone season and the dry season. So then you have to design your strategy according to those seasons as well, so that you plan your maintenance during the seasons, uh, not the cyclone seasons or you know, the good seasons. Uh, the other thing very important is bad, bad, bad numbers. Eh? As we, uh, all of us know that uh, Itons are uh, magnet for beds, that's what they say, because there's the only structure available out in the ocean for the beds to sit. So we have to be mindful of when we do our strategic plan of the bird nesting or the breeding times of those birds, the migration. So all these things has to be taken account of. Uh, vegetation growth is, is very significant, if, as I've seen uh, in our work in the Pacific, that sometimes when we do install an iton, uh, the land is acquired by the component authority, but the land which is in front or the land where through which the iTone uh, is viewed is belongs to say, a private community or a villager. And then uh, once the vegetation starts growing around it, there's always a problem of uh, visibility of the iTone. And then the issue comes in of uh, either clearing the vegetation. So there's a conflict between the landowners and the component authority of, of these kind of uh, situation where the vegetation takes over the itons. So this thing is very important when designing uh, your itons, where to place them. Uh, so if you have a strategy to do that in the first place, then we can uh, solve all these problems. Impact on the environment. Everybody knows about environmental impact on itons. So we have to know where to install our itons, whether it's in protected area, coral reef, or nesting grounds, or so forth. So now that we have seen the, the strategy, how you what factors you have to consider for your strategy, we know, now we have to look at the principles of maintenance. What we see in the principles of maintenance is that the factors design the maintenance strategy. So how do we develop a maintenance strategy? So these are the principles. Right? So we have to develop a maintenance strategy, and then we have to design new items with maintenance in mind. So following the guidelines principles, guiding principles may assist the authorities uh, in developing the overall ITON maintenance strategy. ITON service delivery is composed of user requirements, system design, and system maintenance. Therefore, it is very critical to account for the long-term maintenance and logistic support early in the design process. So when you're designing ITONs, you have to uh, uh, consider all those things to have a proper ITON uh, design. The other thing is minimizing the total cost of ownership. I'm not going to talk too much about it now. Uh, we'll have some very specific examples uh, later in the presentation from uh, Solomon Islands and from PNG about total cost of ownership. Uh, the other one is uh, assess and improving uh, the improving the performance. 
this is through a continuous assessment of reliability of the equipment and supportability, maintainability uh, should be undertaken to permit the ongoing improvement of equipment design and maintenance procedures. The next one is maximizing intervals between maintenance visits. What, what, what the aim is here so that we spend little time on maintenance so that uh, instead of going every week to do a maintenance, we try to maximize the time. So with three months or six months or yearly maintenance. We'll talk a little bit more uh, uh, further in our PowerPoint. Uh, the other one, minimizing the impact on the environment. We know that we have to be mindful of the environment of the itons. And then we have to comply with the legislation, international standards and policies. Health and safety, as we know, health and safety of the workers and also the public where the ITON is installed. Uh, we cannot have a big, bright uh, uh, ITON navigation sitting in someone's backyard and blinding the people around. So we have to co do consider about the health and safety of the staff who work on the on the ITONs and also where the ITON is situated. All these things we have to the, consider for principles of maintenance. And then commissioning is also very important. Commissioning of uh, the item very carefully. In terms of commissioning, uh, what we have seen here is that uh, this is not much, uh, not very well articulated in the guide, ILA guidelines. Uh, the commissioning uh, in the guidelines says that uh, the commissioning must be reported must be distributed and archived. Uh, what I'd like to note here is that uh, I would suggest that the ITON report must be sent to the competent authority and NAV area coordinated so that uh, it can be promulgated as an MSI or maritime safety information uh, so that all the mariners in the area and the charting authorities are aware of uh, this new ITONs which have been commissioned. Uh, what we have seen mostly in the Pacific is that uh, uh, sometimes there's millions of dollars spent on new items being uh, put in place and then the last bit where they are not uh, being uh, uh, not being uh, linked with the charting authorities or the publication so that uh, they are not shown on the chart. So what you see on the on the chart is totally different from what's on the ground. So it's very important to make that connection so that those new items have a link so that all these mariners uh, are aware of the new items in the area. So these very important uh, things I'd like you guys to note. Uh, so the commissioning of items. So commissioning is the process of setting equipment uh, to work and then confirming its correct operation. So the, the responsibility of commissioning, it lies with the competent authority. And it is very important that any commissioning is carried out by the competent, competent personnel. We have the person who is commissioning the equipment has to be competent and who is not directly involved in the installation or deployment, which will allow a fresh look at all the relevant requirements and specification. So we, we will give a sort of a second kind of look. You don't know a same person who does the um, uh, the design and the, the 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 design and that so we want a sort of a different pe person to go out and commission the equipment so that he has a different look and uh, to the iton uh, so the measurements obtained during commissioning should be used for subsequent uh, maintenance checks what i mean here is that uh, once you do your commissioning, you'll be noting down your nominal range, your sector angles, uh, your condition of your chain maybe. So what this will help is that when in the future, when you go back for your maintenance, you'll have a record to fall back on. So, so, so that you know that, okay, this standard of chain or this thickness of chain only lasts so many years or so many months. Or the sector angle during commissioning was this. And when you do your maintenance, then you find it that, that your sector uh, is not, not aligned or it has moved. So this is very important to uh, have a good record of your commissioning.
like I mentioned before, yes, in the, in the red, the details of new commission items should be sent to charting authorities and they were a coordinator so that all of us know that new items are in place and uh, are used accordingly. Now looking at the maintenance goals, what are different goals uh, for maintenance that we have to have in mind? First thing is called the true life maintenance cost to exceed initial procurement. Uh, I think Adam uh, will give you a good example of this in his uh, presentation later on. So, so, so the aim is to reduce uh, need for maintenance. We, that's why I said before that we want have an equipment that uh, we don't go out maintaining uh, very often. We want equipment that we go out maintaining, you know, as minimum as possible. Uh, extended time between uh, maintenance. Minimize unplanned failures. How do we minimize unplanned failures? We'll look at the different uh, uh, item service interval later on and we'll see how we can minimize those unplanned failures. Uh, then you can base your maintenance on evidence of need. And then you facilitate your maintenance tasks accordingly. The last one, minimizing logistical footprints. You don't want to going up and down uh, uh, every day or every week to uh, add on to have maintenance because you're going to have a footprint, whether it's a carbon footprint or, uh, or just trampling on a coral reef. So this is, you have to think all of this as your maintenance goals when you try designing your maintenance. So all of these things, if you meet all these goals, this will definitely help you to reduce the total cost of ownership. Moving on, so the total cost of ownership, uh, as you can see uh, on the picture on the right, so the initial purchase price, as you can see, is just the tip of the iceberg. Eh? So when you buy an iTone, say a port light, you know, it costs you maybe a thousand dollars to buy a port light, but then the uh, other costs that are associated with it, it is just uh, a lot. Example for in the Pacific, when you buy a light, say from Australia or New Zealand, it'll cost you maybe a thousand dollars, but to ship that light to one of the countries here, it'll cost you another thousand dollars. And then you have to hire personnel to install it. Yeah, then you need your training, you need your operating uh, uh, energy, you go, your consumables, your service maintenance, repairs, spare parts, commissioning, and finally when you dispose it. So all of these things are part of the total cost of ownership. I'm not going to talk too much about this because I'll let some specific examples from our Pacific partners to give you a more detailed explanation on this. The next one is uh, item service interval. Very important. How do we decide on how uh, often do we service uh, these items? So the breakdown uh, of item service can have significant impact on the cost of service uh, provision. Uh, the maintenance of systems to ensure continuous performance is very critical. Uh, there are two ways to carry out uh, this maintenance, whether we call it the corrective maintenance, and the other one is called is the preventive maintenance. So corrective maintenance is done rapidly after something has failed. And then the preventive maintenance is done at the predetermined intervals, either it be, uh, be time-based or uh, condition-based. So the two forms of preventive maintenance, the one that is done at regular intervals, we call it planned maintenance. So regular intervals can be in days or months or years. And then the aim for the regular maintenance is to refurbish or replace before comp uh, the component fails. The ex for example, when we buy our cars, we always uh, told by the dealer that you have to bring back for service at every 5,000 kilometers or every so many hours of driving. That's the same thing applies to the items. So you have to have your service maintenance at regular intervals or planned maintenance. And then equ equipment uh, inspected at uh, fixed intervals. So planned maintenance are based on calendar times, as I said before, or operating hours. And this is how do you decide on your timing or that is uh, to do with the fixed time or fixed uh, operating hours is through a risk analysis. So you can see that anything done here is always done through risk analysis. So you have to do a risk analysis and see, and then always follow the manufacturer's recommendations. So when you buy your new ice to navigation, the manufacturer will tell you maybe, okay, if every three months, you might just have to go and just have a visual check to check the temperature or check the, the corrosion. So 
you have to always follow your manufacturer's recommendations and guidelines. And then other one is called intelligence-based maintenance, also to do with uh, performance records while record keeping. So that's how you get your intelligence-based maintenance. And then, and when needed based on actual condition is called condition-based monitoring. So condition-based monitoring uh, decisions on the evidence of need based on actual equipment condition rather than the usage interval. And this can also minimize spare cost, spare pass cost, and the time spent for the maintenance. Moving on. So what are the some of the different parameters uh, that you have to observe during your condition condition based uh, monitoring? Uh, I'm not going to read through all of them, but for example, when you go looking for your buoys, so if you look for your chain wear, your position of the sinker, your color, your thickness of the paint and the metal, look at your day marks, marine fouling, etc., etc. So these are the, some of the different factors or parameters that you have to look for condition-based monitoring. The main thing that uh, the bottom you can see says uh, condition-based monitoring, repair after breakdown or run to failure is very common. We know this is always very common everywhere in, uh, around the world. That's a, when something when the light goes off. That's the time we go and trying to put a new light bulb or repair it. But this is not what is recommended uh, by Ayala. He says, yeah, condition uh, corrective maintenance uh, is not an option. So we'll try and do maintenance before equipment fails, so that we can still stay within those Ayala availability standards. Uh, that is the last slide before I give it to my colleague uh, Francesca. A spares. Spare holdings, what we need to have uh, in our space to the fewer spares we have, the, the the cost for the authority will be less as well. So we're trying to minimize the number of component parts. So we try and have a have an ISO navigation like uh, nowadays we we try and have integrated IPSL lanterns so, so that everything is in one piece. We don't have to have a, have a solar panel separately, the battery separate, then you have to do your uh, uh, all the components separate. We try and consider minimum number of parts for the equipment. Uh, so, and another thing it says reduce parts by adopting commonality of parts. If you have common parts, then if one item fails, we can the spare parts can be swapped around to the other items and standardized designs to permit common maintenance. Uh, establishing maintenance consensus through configuration management, which is applied over the life cycle of the item system, and it provides visibility and control of performance. And then encourage competition between suppliers. If you are going through your in ILI industrial suppliers, it's very important that uh, you try and get your different costs from different suppliers so that you get some uh, benefits for your cost. And then selling redundant stock. We don't want to have hundreds of stock of, uh, of one sort of uh, equipment. If it's not used anymore, it's a good idea to sell that stock so that it can free up your cash to buy some other stuff and do other maintenance. Uh, thank you for this. So we'll move on. I'll give my floor to Francesca now so she can continue. Over to you, Francesca. Thank you, Salesh. And uh, thank you. Nothing like a good lecture early in the morning. <laughs> and it was really interesting to hear Salesh. Even I, myself, I learned many things. So yeah, moving on, and I'll try to make it short so to give the floor to other presenters and questions at the end. Uh, we wanted to just briefly touch base on the assistance provided in the South Pacific around aids to navigation. And so, um, as mentioned, uh, the Pacific community, the organization selection I work for, is uh, governed by 22 countries and territories. We serve the needs of around 12 million people around the South Pacific. And the Pacific Safety of Navigation project funded by IFAN uh, started in 2016 and has 13 country uh, target countries so far um, with the overall overall aim to improve safety of navigation in the Pacific through enhanced capacity and systems. So during the second phase of the project, which started in 2018, uh, we had two main results in mind, the second of which was to enhance uh, the Pacific Island countries and territories capacities to deliver effective aids to navigation services through regional coordination, qualification and standards. So in 2019, uh, as you can see from uh, the small yet nice picture, we delivered the first 
uh, Ayala Level 1 manager course ever organized in the South Pacific and nine representatives from nine different Pacific Island countries and territories have been certified aids to navigation managers and it has been quite an achievement for the region because not all countries which had been trained had aids to navigation managers in house and so it was really really nice uh, to to train and certify them uh, during 20 uh, over the course of 2020 to 2021 we were supposed to and we were aiming to uh, conduct workshops and trainings on aids to navigation maintenance based on Ayala level 2 guidelines because uh, aids to navigation maintenance was uh, one of the main actually area of work identified by the countries as a, a needed focus so uh, we try to build up by uh, our capacity building strategy by first of all uh, train aids to navigation managers and then concentrating on aids to navigation maintenance so um, yeah the assistance that we were going to provide on level two uh, as I said, we were supposed to, um, so we developed, Salesh and I developed a um, one day workshop on aids to navigation maintenance based on the IALA level two guidelines. And uh, we were aiming to deliver it in 10 uh, countries in uh, 2020. And uh, February last year, it feels like a lifetime ago, but it was just uh, one year ago. Uh, we been to Kiribati and that was our first and last mission of the year. And we delivered that one day workshop, which was actually uh, welcomed very nicely by, by the country. And uh, it was quite a success. Then obviously March uh, arrived in the Pacific as well and COVID-19 arrived in the Pacific as well. So our organization stopped all travels. Um, and so we were wondering uh, what to do. So we had to adapt as everyone else. And um, since there were no travels allowed, uh, we wonder if we could deliver the aids to navigation maintenance workshops remotely, uh, but we thought that this would have had uh, quite a lot of disadvantages such as the screen fatigues. Uh, we were bombarded since last year with lots of webinars and time spent uh, in front of a computer and we realized that it was a subject way too long to deliver online and it needed face-to-face -face interaction. Uh, so we decided we had a long brainstorming with uh, Salesh and uh, he came up with the idea of condensing uh, Ayala Level 2 guidelines and develop actually a smaller booklets and guidelines posters with the main information about the uh, various technical points of the Ayala Level 2 guidelines. And uh, the advantages of that are um, quite uh, quite major first of all they are easy to locate the information the basic information and the most important information are easy to locate rather than going through the uh, very technical and long ayala level 2 uh, guidelines they are easy to follow by anyone even the non aid to navigation specialist and i must say that here in the pacific uh, given the sizes of maritime administrations very small we don't often have much personnel dedicated and trained specifically on Aidstone, Aid, it's navigation, so it's it's quite handy to have a document which can be followed by anyone. Uh, easy to follow and waterproof because we have uh, um, published them, I, I'll show you in, in a second. And they are the perfect starting point for the maintenance of the types of Aidstone navigation that we find in the Pacific Island countries, small island countries here. So, we are very happy to <laughs> present it to, to, to you all uh, the uh, finished product of the work of uh, Salesh, I, myself, and our graphic artist. So those are the its navigation maintenance guideline guide uh, supplement to IA level, level two training. So this is, I hope you can all see it. This is the published uh, booklet. It's quite small, it's waterproof. It cannot be ripped off because it's waterproof, so super easy to carry. And it consists of five. Uh, you can. It consists of fine um, five uh, posters. The one before. Okay, sorry. Going on. 
So the first one is uh, on the H2 Navigation Maintenance BUOI components and what to check. As you can see, it's a very user-friendly, very colored, and just gives the right information with a visual um, identification as well. And the second one is on H2 Navigation Maintenance for the Daymarks. Again, very colorful, quite uh, easy to follow. Uh, with detection, recognition, and identification, and then the various steps that have to be taken for uh, each, uh, each component. The maintenance of the mooring components and what to check. Again, um, our graphic artist did a super nice job in showing well all the underneath, under the sea parts and what to check with pictures as well, so that it's easy to follow once, um, once conducting the, the maintenance. Uh, fourth one is on the paints, the coatings, and the re reflective materials. In the Pacific, uh, obviously, uh, the um, amount of sun and the uh, amount of uh, um, reflection is quite powerful all year round. So those are one of the those are uh, some of the um, of the components that get degraded uh, the fastest. So really need to be uh, maintained quite quite efficiently. The fifth one is on the lanterns and the lamp components and what to check. Again, uh, this has quite a longer list, but it's um, it's uh, needed. <laughs> so again, there's a it's a, it's a condensation of uh, of the long list in the Ayala Level Two guidelines. So this is a, um, a snapshot of uh, what we have come up with as a solution to not being able to, to travel to countries. And uh, as always in life, uh, let me be philosophical, when something previewed doesn't happen, then very often we come up with a better solution. And we really do think that this is a, a tool that can be used not only in the Pacific, but in other countries which may have the same configuration, maybe smaller maritime administration or smaller uh, personnel. So if you want to the guidelines for your country, we will be super happy to provide it to you. Please contact me or Ayala and uh, we'll get in touch. Thank you. Thank you, Francesca and Salesh, for this very interesting presentation and also uh, for announcing this fantastic new product uh, that is what you indeed say maybe even a better solution as before we had COVID and also a positive story. So I hope, uh, Francesca, you will also drop your email address in the chat box because I think not only the Pacific, but the whole world can benefit from this by using these uh, guidelines. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, let's now go to our uh, next speaker. And our next speaker is also a Worldwide Academy alumni. It's Captain Patrick Wamahi, who participated in 2015 to one of the first aids to navigation manager courses in Paris. And Patrick, you are still famous in Paris. Currently, he is the aids to navigation manager in the Solomon Islands Maritime Authority. And he will uh, show us in his presentation how Solomon Island deals with aids to navigation maintenance. Uh, Patrick, the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Geraldine. Thank you, Salis. Uh, I thank you, uh, Francesca, for inviting Solomon Islands to participate in this uh, webinar. Um, is, uh, Geraldine, t tell me if you can see the presentation. Not yet. Take your time, Patrick. Yeah, can you see it now? No, I cannot see it yet. Patrick, if to share it using the button on the top right hand corner, we say share content. OK, OK, OK. The top right hand corner near the leave button. 
Okay, I'm sharing it now. Pin sheet now, Geraldine? No, not yet. Salesh, do you have the copy that you can share it? Is that possible, maybe? Okay. Okay, let me try. Patrick, you can. Yeah. Once you click the share button, then you have to choose from the screen which one is your slide presentation. Then you can share it. Can you try again, Patrick? Or? Yeah, okay. Yes, we can it see it. Nice. Yes, that's better. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Go ahead, Patrick. Thank you, uh, uh, sorry, uh, Francisca. Yes, uh, uh, this is uh, Solomon Islands uh, perspectives on age to navigation uh, management, maintenance, sorry. The Aton in uh, Solomon Islands, the Aton unit in Solomon Islands uh, was established in the former Marine Division in the early 1970s. Uh, and now today's Aton unit in the SEMA has only six staff. And we have about, not about, but 50 lighthouses and more than uh, 400 unlit beacons in eight of our provinces spreading out uh, throughout the Solomon Islands. Uh, we have a few challenges. Um, some of these uh, lack of uh, justification for budget increase. Uh, since 1970, we have only one risk assessment uh, done, uh, but now we are planning for some more risk assessment in the country. One of them is a lack of uh, qualified and motivated staff. Uh, we have only two ATON managers, but one is working with the hydrographic office. And we are planning to get some uh, technicians trained, especially the junior officers, so that they will have a deep understanding of ATON in order to be motivated. And the worst thing is uh, bureaucracy, which slows down item maintenance and repair. Uh, moving on to the next slide. Uh, this is uh, SIMA, SIMSA SIMA strategic action. Uh, we want to deliver effective and compliant safety of navigation service to the people and maritime operators in, in Solomon Islands water. Yes, uh, and this is uh, our objective, SEMA objectives, uh, to deliver, as I said already, a compliant safety of navigation service people and maritime operators in Solomon Islands water by the following, uh, implementing SOLAS Conventions Chapter 5, Regulation 13. Uh, this is maintained by maintaining of existing lighthouses and beacons installations of new atons at recommended areas in inner waters uh, to uniformity of aids to navigation this is achieved by taking into account ILA recommendations and guidelines when establishing uh, such aids pre the promulgation of MSI uh, this information relating to aids to navigation be made available to all concerned and the impact of this is uh, reduce maritime incidences. And the main thing is improve economy through shipping. And our target is by 2023, all ATON should be inspected and maintained uh, 100%. Uh, the reason is to maintain the operational status of all ATONs and to be IALA compliant. Moving on to our next slide. Uh, this is our level of service. 
as we all know, the level of service is uh, coming, you know, service by competing authority to marinas who are navigating, operating in an area, as well as clients or governments are responsible for funding the provisions of the relevant services. The level of service may be articulated through the statement that should be clear, uh, very easy to understand, and available to all our stakeholders. Well, uh, factors affecting a level of service for quality. Uh, mentioned here one is selection of high quality equipment from Ayala industrial members and supplies of chain, uh, structures, and other eight and spares. Um, at the moment, yes, we have uh, spares both from Sea Light and Australian Maritime System, uh, which are Ayala industrial members. Uh, we also keep records of eight ton availability. Uh, we use uh, direct visual monitoring. Uh, site owners and land owners. Uh, they, they monitor the lights and report to to us, SIMA, uh, that's of any outages or vandalism. And now level of uh, level one technician are still to be trained. Uh, but at the moment we have uh, limited but enough spares to maintain our aton. And the right hand corner you can see the level of service. Uh, type of service that we provided and their level of service. Let's say moving on to the next slide. Uh, SP, SPC assistance to Solomon Islands. The SPC safety of navigation project, that's a 2015 Ayala plus SPC uh, visit a country and they came up with uh, 39 recommendations. In 2017, SPC made a follow up visit and closed eight of those recommendations. And 2018, SPC workshop on end of phase one. And then uh, Solomon Islands is uh, no longer in the ILA target list in the Pacific. And in 2018, uh, phase two. At the risk assessment. Okay. The expected uh, outcomes on phase two uh, is that by 2021, this, this year, uh, which is now being planned, a risk assessment to be carried out at uh, Noro International Port. And by 2022, at least two new trained staff to ILA standard in SIMA Aton unit. And by 2022, a risk assessment is also planned to be carried out at uh, one of our ports at Gisohaba, and it's a process. And by 2022, all ILA recommendations should be closed. Uh, this is quite ambitious, but we'll try our best to do it. Now, the types of uh, Aton used in Solomon Island, as you can see on these photos, we have the real light plus uh, its day maga. We have also used the special maga voice for the uh, cable entrances to some of our ports. And we have uh, isolated danger yeah, Maka Lighthouse. We also have uh, other lighthouses, uh, unlit beacons, unlit boys and lit boys, which are also spread out in the country as well. Yes, these are continue with the type types of age navigation in Solomon Islands. Oh, uh, unlit beacon. The unlit port and starboard. Then we have a port lead buoy and a starboard lead buoy. And uh, this is how we carry out maintenance in Solomon Islands. We have the list of lights. 
uh, which is uh, completed. And we have included in this uh, uh, registry the maintenance plan, the maintenance budget plan, and uh, our strategic work plan. That's every year. And uh, now we're going to look at some of the specific examples of uh, these plants and uh, budgets. We have this, uh, as Salis already mentioned today, the preventive uh, maintenance is to prevent uh, failures, the plant maintenance, and every quarterly condition based maintenance. Like, uh, yeah, but quarterly based uh, based maintenance is carried out after every three months. Uh, we have to visit the sites and paint the lighthouse, replace uh, what's not working. Uh, this is done uh, quarterly, and there's also the uh, condition based uh, maintenance. So these are the inspection forms uh, that we use, the corrective maintenance form, the IL availability form, and the ITON uh, inspection procedures. As we nearly have all the same uh, structures, uh, this form is for that, uh, especially for the for those uh, structural uh, inspection, where we check all the parts and on the structure and recommend what to do, the amount of paint uh, to be used on, those, each, on each structure. The lantern inspection form is also in this one. And you have the plan work and unplanned work incorporated in this form as well. So this is the next slide is the total ownership cost of Aton. Uh, which seems uh, we have uh, the sea light and the Australian maritime system as our international suppliers. And the local cost, we usually send out uh, tenders to uh, local companies with the specification supplied by the Australian Maritime System uh, because they are IALA compliant. And then uh, after the procurement, the, the local suppliers uh, send us the, the spares. It, as, uh, as you can see or know that our, uh, our atons are all spread out throughout the country, the cost of uh, hiring the ship consumes a lot of, uh, I mean, the bigger part of our budget, our aton budgets to do the maintenance. We also have a small uh, workshop where minor repairs and fabrications and storage of our spares and equipment, eight on spares and equipment, uh, kept and are done. The manpower administrative cost, as I mentioned earlier, there are six staff in the eight on unit. And to the salary of this, uh, Six uh, eight on objects is approximately uh, 24 US annually. The cost of uh, disposal of red eight on depends on its location. If it's uh, further out in the islands, islanded craft is high at approximately US. Uh, $4,000 per day. Uh, as I say, this really affects our 
eight ton budget. Yes, and moving on to the next slide, the spares that we have in stock. Uh, it's very limited, but we don't have, don't want to keep a lot of spares. We want to buy something and then deploy it at the same time or move the spares around to reduce the cost. And vandalism is also one factor that uh, really affects our eight spares, uh, but this is controlled by installing a vandal proof uh, spares and prosecuting people who damage or destroy our eight -ton. And that's all from uh, Solomon Island. Thank you. Thank you very much, Patrick. I am really impressed about your presentation and all the work you have done. I think this is an example to the world and many, many can learn from this. I, I was really impressed about your level of statement and uh, level of service statements. That looks really good. So um, I think many will learn from this. Let's go to our last speaker. Our last speaker is Adam Hay, and he is well known in Ayala as he was the former chair of the ENG Working Group on Technical Knowledge and Sustainability. He also followed the Master of Marine Aid to Navigation Management course at Ayala. He is the director and founder at MNAF Solutions. He is very experienced in the Asia-Pacific region, including delivery of aids to navigation and maritime surveillance services in remote, isolated and environmentally sensitive areas. Uh, he will give us a bit more insight on how to reduce the total cost of ownership in aids to navigation. Adam, the floor is yours. Yes, good morning everyone from Northern Australia. I see a lot of familiar faces and a lot of new faces. Uh, thanks, Jared and Ayala, for uh, the opportunity to present this. Um, you'll find that there's a lot of recurrent themes in my presentation uh, with the very, with the excellent presentations from uh, the previous presenters. Uh, mine is probably in a, more of an assembly of practical tips and lessons learned on uh, quite a significant uh, AIDS navigation maintenance program that I was involved in in Papua New Guinea. Uh, so my presentation is going to be fairly short. Uh, going to go through a few things, uh, the total cost of ownership, uh, effective service life, choice of equipment and structures, maintenance and calculating total cost of ownership. Uh, so total cost of ownership is basically it's the full cost of an asset over its useful life. Um, this includes all phases uh, right from procurement and installation, uh, the operation and the maintenance of the ATON, uh, right down to the decommissioning and the costs that are associated with, with safely and cleanly removing a structure from service. Uh, and, and every phase is quite critical and every phase contributes to the total cost and you really have to to focus on each each different phase in a different way. Probably the most, the biggest variable on the total cost of ownership is the effective service life of the ATON. This is certainly something we focused on. Uh, an effective service life of an ATON is basically the period of time that it can be reliably used to achieve the required availability. So it's the time that that ATON can operate to, to the service level that you need, depending on its category and to meet its required availability. So achieving a long lifespan of an ATON structure is how you get a long effective service life and that's achieved by a couple of different things. Number one is the uh, design and use of the right materials. Is uh, planned maintenance. So probably one of the most important phases of, of effective service life is the initial design and materials. So this is really critical when you're looking at ATON, especially in some of the uh, the very remote and aggressive marine environments that we're installing them in. There's a lot of different things to consider here. 
So depending where you're going to put the aton, you really need to identify the most suitable structure and the most suitable equipment for the site. There is no one fit all, uh, and you've really got to look at environmental conditions. You've got to look at, at how remote the site is. Um, there's several different things you've got to you've got to look carefully at when you're deciding on the right type of structure. Uh, and you really you need to keep it simple. Um, there's a lot of cost in installing aton structures. Uh, the simpler you keep it. Uh, the less expensive it is up front, and you should really always design for maintenance in mind. So you've got to be careful of the type of materials that you use. Of course, we all know that corrosion is the biggest enemy of any aton structure, um, so that you've really got to look carefully at the material types that you're using, especially your steels, uh, your grade of concrete. Uh, and sometimes spending a bit more up front in, in the, using the right materials for your structure can reduce the total cost of ownership over its... Uh, effective lifespan. And as always, you should standardise. There's nothing wrong with having 30 of the same structures if it's in the same environment. There's no need to get too fancy. There's no need uh, to design big, expensive and difficult to maintain structures. Uh, so then we look at maintenance, of course. Maintenance is critical, as we all know. That's why I've got maintain, 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 because if you're not maintaining the life, uh, your structure, the lifespan is going to be significantly reduced. Uh, maintenance has to be planned. I think this was mentioned in, in both the previous presentations. Reactive maintenance is, is ineffective. So turning up to an aton once it's failed or partly collapsed will not fix your issue. You need to be planning and you need to, to be getting ahead of that structural deterioration or your equipment failure. Uh, the maintenance should be kept in cycles uh, and reduce mobilisations. This was particularly important in our experience uh, because of the logistics and just the widespread geographical locations and just how, how remote it was. So it's important to plan if you're going to do a maintenance run and you've got a certain region, it's important to plan it so you go through that whole region in one hit instead of chartering vessels per day or chartering vessels uh, for a week and then demobilising, then remobilising re again. And I think Patrick made that quite clear in his presentation that uh, vessel costs are uh, one of the biggest costs of all in maintenance. Uh, and in other countries, it's road, it's helicopter, and it purely depends on where you are. And again, carefully plan logistics, re reduce the total cost. So th the more accurate you, accurately you plan, uh, your logistics and your vessel charters, your helicopter charters, uh, the less cost is involved. Uh, another big thing for us was was training and diversity of skills. Uh, really, when you've got a, a whole ATON network, there's a number of different things you need to consider. Uh, you've got boat operators, um, you've got community liaison officers, you've got painting, you've got uh, a lot of climbing, um, you've got a lot of diving. So you really you need to assemble a crew of people that have got that range of skills that allow you to, to basically handle any maintenance or any issues that you find when you arrive on site. Uh, and this was particularly important for us. Remote sites equal safety squared because safety is so critical when it comes to Aton um, and often doing a little bit of training or a little bit of awareness or having good systems, while it may cost a bit up front, you've always got to ask yourself what the cost is of a serious safety incident when you're in a very remote site where there's very little uh, way to respond to an emergency. So these are a few practical tips on structural maintenance that just lessons learnt from us. Uh, pick an effective coating system that is easy to use in the field. So if you do have a lot of steel structures, you don't want to be always swapping between different paints. You, you need to pick a, a paint system that works, but, but also that is easy uh, to use in the field. Uh, and also is easy to, to control for the mitigation of environmental impact. Um, repair, prime and paint. Don't just paint over rust. This is another lesson we learnt that having a bit of rust on a structure, the easiest way is to slap a bit of paint across the top, but this does not resolve the issue. Um, so you really do need to repair that bit of corrosion. You need to prime it, you need to paint it. Sometimes that can mean the difference between doing it once every couple of years or once every five years. Shallow water, if you've got shallow water structures, you, your biggest risk is around that splash zone uh, where, where the steel becomes oxidised. 
So you should look at protection systems for that splash zone, which can significantly increase the, the lifespan of a steel structure in water. Uh, you can look at Denso, or you can look at anodes or cathodic protection. Uh, use stainless steel wherever possible. You could also consider aluminium, but non-corrosive uh, metals are always good to use in a marine environment because it just reduces the amount of wear and tear and maintenance. And avoid galvanic corrosion, so you should always use the same steels. Uh, the impacts of galvanic corrosion when you, when you combine mild steel and stainless steel or aluminium can uh, deteriorate quite quickly. And standardise your consumables. So for all your paint systems, for your protection systems, for your fasteners, your nuts and bolts, try and standardise it to one particular type. So number one, it's easy to procure, and number two, it's easy to store. So eight on equipment, standardise equipment and service as much as possible. Uh, I think Patrick made a good point on this one in his presentation. You should try and keep your equipment, depending on the ranges that you've got, the different, the different structures, different categories, Try and just use the minimal amount of brands and models that you can, much easier to store. Uh, and plan your replacements. This is quite a simple one, but it's quite effective. So for things like batteries, if you're changing batteries out every five years, it's much easier if you've got a register that tracks that, shows you the times you should be replacing them uh, instead of ad hoc or, or even worse, guessing when you should be changing batteries out, because quite often that will lead to battery failures. Uh, Minimise your stock holdings. If you do the above, you really can keep your stock levels quite low. Uh, this might seem quite common sense, but I've seen it a lot in the Pacific, especially with uh, water-based structures. It's easy to pull a bucket of salt water up to clean a structure down. Obviously, that leads to corrosion, so you should always use fresh water. Uh, use appropriate bird deterrents. And attention to detail saves return trips to the site. Uh, and it's important for a maintenance te technician to understand that when he is maintaining a piece of equipment, double check everything, make sure your battery cables are tight, make sure bolts are not loose, make sure that you've, you've, you've checked inside the lamp because quite often just missing one simple detail may lead to a failure, which may lead to a, a, a very high cost of returning to the site to fix it. And test and record. So everything you do on site, test it. Uh, and make sure that you record everything that you do. So records are key to planning, the key to planning maintenance, the key to planning budgeting. Um, you should use documented information, so use controlled reports, uh, use spreadsheets, even use software if you have it. Um, keep those processes recorded, keep your reports uh, easily accessible. Uh, identify, document, schedule improvements or major repairs. Quite often you'll come across a a structure, it might be an older structure where there are issues that are developing. You should get into recording those in the early stages. Uh, and if there is a major repair coming up in a couple of years, start to record it, start to plan for it, start to budget it. And record your use of consumables. Again, seems like a simple one, but if you record how much paint, how much Denso, how many bolts you use every year, it's very easy to, to reorder for the next year so you don't find shortfalls during your maintenance program. Uh, it's just it's just a little exercise we used to use for calculating total cost. So to work out the total cost for an Aton structure annualised, uh, this is the formula we use. So the total cost annualised was capital cost plus your maintenance cost times the effective life divided by effective life, as an example. So your capital cost for a structure might be 100,000. Uh, it might cost $1,000 a year maintenance. So the important thing here to realise is your effective service life, how it it impacts that. So if you've got a structure that only works for five years and you have to remove it, replace it, then that gives you an annualised cost of 21000 uh, Over 10 years, it's vastly reduced. So that, that just is a bit of an example of why it's so important um, in your effective service life, which is designing and installing the right structure and maintaining. Um, so I'm just going to do a quick exercise for a beacon here. These are similar structures we installed in Papua New Guinea, uh, about 65 of them. So the capital cost of using a mild steel structure might be $35,000, whereas you're looking at an extra $15,000 to, to use stainless steel. So your annual maintenance cost for mild steel is obviously quite, quite high, because you've got a lot of painting, you've got a lot of checking, you've got, you've got a lot of Denso replacement. 
whereas the annual cost of stainless steel might only be $500. So your effective life of a mild steel structure, if maintained, would be uh, 10 years. And the effective life of stainless steel, which is 20 years, as it's a much more durable, easy to maintain structure, is 3,000. So you can see quite a big difference in the annualised cost, especially when you uh, when you look at the cost of, say, using mild steel structure and having to replace it after 10 years, you repeat the cycle. And without main maintenance, those lifespans are significantly reduced. And my last slide is, we all consider the financial costs, but this does not ish, uh, address the fundamental issue of safety availability. So you might, you might save some money on installing uh, low cost structure, you might save some money on not maintaining it, um, but basically what is the cost of a serious maritime incident? And I mean, that's why these ATON are being installed. And uh, that's me, thank you very much. Uh, that's all. Thank you, Adam, uh, for this very interesting uh, presentation and to see your point of view as an industrial member and then see that the principles are exactly the same or stay the same. So we do a good job there. I think this is a very practical approach that will help uh, many people and many countries. There are several questions in the chat box and some of them have already been answered as you were uh, talking. One of the questions was, could you go into more detail into DENSO for corrosion protection? And somebody uh, already posted, Simon already posted the link, but maybe you want to go a bit more in detail on that, Adam. Yeah, okay, so DENSO is basically just, a, it's a petrol atom tape wrapping. Uh, it's, DENSO is a proprietary product, but there's a lot of different products uh, available on the market, but it's quite a good one because it is, um, it's well designed and well made. And it's basically, it, it, it's a tape that you wrap around um, the splash, splash zone of a steel structure. Uh, it, it prevents any oxygen getting to the steel, so it therefore pre present, prevents oxidization and pre prevents the rust. Uh, there's a lot of different types that you can use from very simple systems to quite um, comprehensive jacket systems that are hydraulically fitted. So you've really got to look at, at your structure you got to look at your maintenance uh, intervals and also your manpower because if installed correctly, it's great, but it, uh, in some of the lower cost applications, there is some cost, ongoing cost to replace it because it, it does come loose a bit sometimes with, with wave and wind action. Okay, thank you. Uh, as I said, there is a link uh, with more information already in the chat box. And what I find a very relevant uh, question from Mr. Rebolo, and I think maybe Salesh uh, will be able to answer this. In the maintenance systems, do you use some remote control systems for status information and failure detection? And Salesh, maybe you can answer this question as you may have an overview of all the countries. Uh, are you aware of such systems being used in the Pacific? Uh, thanks, Geraldine. Uh, uh, here, mostly in the Pacific, uh, we don't have remote uh, monitoring. We usually do visual monitoring. Uh, it's done either by the stakeholders, like the, 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 the captains of the ships going on, they report the, the, the fault and the failures in the ITON. So there's no remote monitoring as such in the Pacific at the moment. Okay, thank you. Uh, Omar, have you identified other questions that have not been answered yet? No, not really, no. No, okay. I think we are ready to close the, the webinar. Yes. Unless there are some questions. Yes. Uh, with others oh, already. Yeah, I see Minsu. Yeah, uh, thank you, Jaradin. I'm not really sure. Uh, uh, my question can go to whom, but uh, is there any uh, specific uh, consideration on the seabed? I think I see a lot of, uh, I mean, in, in that area, a lot of seabed uh, 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 coral reef. So I think uh, just a, just a better than just a normal uh, normal type of uh, sinkers, like uh, putting a, a concrete block. 
on on the coral reef. I mean, do you have any any specific uh, method of cons construction? Adam? Uh, yeah, I might make a comment there, Minsu. Uh, a lot of the structures that we installed uh, when I was working in Papua New Guinea were in some quite environmentally pristine areas. Uh, and the, the guidelines under which we were installing it was for Asian Development Bank funding, and one of the key things was no environmental impact, which is why we went for a lot of uh, those piled structures, because uh, they're very low impact when you install them. Uh, and they're actually they, they're habitat enhancing over the lifespan that you install them. Whereas if you use a, a standard mooring system with the concrete block and a chain, you do you do get really significant coral scarring, and quite often it will destroy the, the habitat within that within that uh, thrash zone of the chain. Um, so that's why we tend to not not go with a lot of mooring buoy systems. It's it's okay in areas of sand, but definitely not in um, if you want to reduce environmental impact in uh, coral habitats. Thank you, uh, Adam. I think this uh, brings us to the official end of the webinar. Uh, many thanks to all of you for staying a bit longer also. And uh, special thanks to our excellent speakers. Please feel free to stay and chat with us after the official end of the webinar. And that is now when we will also stop the recording, but the line will stay open for a bit longer. Thank you very much.